All right. Anyway, so it's uh, it's week nine. Wow. The weeks are, are racing by. I guess it's week three for my baby. She's in her third week of her life. So that's we've got two different week counters going on at the same same time right now. Um, I guess if you're curious how uh, daddy stuff is going, it's pretty good. Um, it's lots of fun. I would say that every week is more fun than the last because like at first they just sit there. They don't do anything. So it's this really cute potato that you have, you know, and you're like, okay, well, great. Every couple hours I can change poop off of you. Um, but the older, the more they go along, they can start doing things. You know, they start kind of looking at you and they grab your little finger and they, I don't know, it's just like you start to appreciate these teeny tiny little gestures and you're looking, you know, you, you assume that they have way more uh, agency than they really have. Like they'll sort of look at you and smile and you'll go, oh, she smiled at me, she smiled at me. And it's like, no, her face muscles are just randomly happen to align at that instant to look like a smile, you know, but you think, wow, that was the first time she ever, she ever smiled at me. And, uh, you know, I will say, you know, it's really given me new perspective on my job, like, you know, dealing with her uh, fussing and pouting and crying all day is great practice for student complaints about midterm grades and these kinds of things. You know, it's really, there's a lot of parallels there. <laughs> oh, that, uh, tough crowd. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, but anyway, I'm having a lot of fun with it. And, um, you know, I continue to really appreciate all the, all the work that uh, Ashley and Amy and section leaders are doing to make it so that I can mostly be absent for, for a lot of the days of the rest of the quarter here. I hope you guys are doing okay with that as well. Um, Okay, so uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about sorting. And uh, we've been talking about hashing for a couple of lectures. There's no homework assignment about hashing. Your, your last homework assignment is out right now. It's uh, the Trailblazer program about graphs. That was due a week from Monday. But since we love you guys, we've decided to extend it to be due on Wednesday next week. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, note, we still don't have any usage of late days on assignment seven, so you've got to turn it in by that date. That's the cutoff, okay? If you don't turn it in by then, we can't accept it for any credit. So please be very careful about that deadline. Um, anyway, but that'll give you a few more days. It's due a week from today. It's due on the 14th right here. Uh, as I have said, in the meantime, the rest of these topics that we're studying are all potentially on the final. So we learned hashing. There's likely to be hashing question on the final. I'm going to teach you sorting today. There's likely going to be a sorting question on the final. We're going to spend a couple of lectures on inheritance after this. There's likely to be an inheritance question on the final. So that's why you care. That's why you should, should uh, listen up or, or uh, watch the rest of this video at the quadruple speed that you're watching right now. So uh, OK, let me go to my slides for today. Let's talk about sorting. I think you know what sorting is. It's when you arrange things into order. Um, there's different orders you could arrange things into. I mean, I think some data types have what you might call a natural order. Like if you have a, a vector of ints and you want to sort them, you would typically say, oh, I put the small values early in the array and the large values later in the array. So you could imagine a natural ordering for lots of different data types. Like what if I have a, a vector of strings? How do I sort them? Well, it's probably like alphabetical order or something like that, you know. But, well, is it, is it case sensitive? Is it case insensitive? Do you always want to sort by alphabetical order? What if you want to sort by length or sort by some other uh, measure? So, I mean, the, the idea of sorting just means coming up with some ordering that you want and then arranging your data to be in that order, okay? Now, one of the things that's interesting about sorting, one of the reasons we like to teach you about sorting is it's just a classic computer science problem and it has this nice property that there's a whole bunch of ways that you can do it. There's a whole bunch of different sorting algorithms, and they're all interesting in their own ways. They have interesting uh, runtime and memory usage requirements to them. Uh, they make a good vehicle for talking about things like big O, talking about recursion and other topics. And, uh, and actually, some of these algorithms are quite clever. It's pretty interesting. So today, I'm going to sort of quickly show you two or three sorting algorithms and, um, you know, the goal I want for you is to understand how they work. Uh, I wouldn't ask you to code any of these from scratch on a test, but I might ask you, you know, here's some data. If I ran this kind of sorting algorithm on this data, what would happen? Draw me a picture, write out some of the things that would happen on a test here. So okay, this list here has a bunch of different sorting algorithms. I'll highlight a few of them going forward now. Um, here's maybe my favorite stupid sorting algorithm. It's called BogoSort. The name comes from the word bogus. Like it's not a real algorithm. Uh, the idea of BOGO sort is you shuffle the data and then you check if it happens to have shuffled itself into sorted order. And if it has, you stop. And if it hasn't, you repeat. <laughs> so I, the analogy I always use is it's like the game 52 pickup where you take a deck of cards and you go 
and you, you throw them up in the air and now you gotta pick them up, right? 52 cards. So um, it's like the probability that your 52 pickup throw of a card deck would land them all perfectly sorted, ace, king, queen, check, 10, you know, all the way sorted order. Of course, that's very unlikely to happen, but if you kept doing it enough times, maybe you would happen to get the sorted uh, output. So th this is a dumb algorithm. Of course, you would never really want to do this. The only reason I want to talk about it is I think it's an interesting question about what the big O of this is. Now, of course, the worst case big O is obvious, right? What's the worst case for this algorithm? You said factorial. Um, that, that might be more of an average case or expected case. What, what about, what's the worst possible thing that could happen if I do this? Never? never? Uh, yeah, is that what you're going to say? Like, infinite, never. It just, it, uh, I just happen to never shuffle it into the right order. Of course, probabilistically, uh, it's infinitely unlikely that you'll never. It's, if you keep doing it forever, it becomes infinitely more and more likely that you will eventually get the right uh, answer, but it's possible you wouldn't. But anyway, um, here's kind of vaguely how this would look if you actually coded this, which I don't really recommend. Bogo sort says, while not sorted, shuffle. Now, of course, those are two functions I would have to write. So is sorted means loop from the start to the finish and check if the neighbors are out of order. So how long does this take to run once, this function? It takes O of n. I'm hearing a couple people say that. Yeah, because I have to loop across the array. I'm looking at the neighbors. If any neighbors are out of order, it's not sorted. So that call once is big O of n. And then it's so while it's not sorted, shuffle. So I think the best case of this algorithm, the, what's the best possible case of this? Because I do think for any sorting algorithm, it's interesting to think about the best case, the likely case, or average case, and the worst case. Worst case is forever, infinite. What's the best possible thing that could happen here? It's already sorted? Right, that's an interesting kind of weird edge case. What if you pass in an array that is already sorted? How long does this take? Oh, of it, it calls is sorted once. It says that yes, it is sorted. And so the while loop doesn't enter, and so it stops, right? So this actually takes O of n best case, infinity worst case. What's average? I heard somebody say factorial. I think that's a good intuition. It's something like, uh, you know, if you take some of our theory classes, like 103, 109, you talk more about probability. And so, I mean, the likelihood that you're going to shuffle into the right order, I think of a deck of cards. Like, there's one out of 52 cards that should be first. So it's a one out of 52 that that card lands first. And then, given that that one landed first, there's a one in 51 probability that the next card, the correct card, landed second. So you kind of have one out of 52, one out of 51, one out of 50, one out of 49, all, all the way down. And so it's kind of the product of all that, which ends up being the one over n factorial likelihood that you'll get it right on a given shuffle. So I mean, there's, there's roughly that many um, uh, 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 times you would have to do it. So this is horrible. <laughs> you know, n factorial runtime really sucks, right? So I mean, we're not discussing this as a serious algorithm. If you actually want to see it run, <laughs> I actually have the code in a Qt Creator project. And uh, this code I'm going to run again for each sorting algorithm, where I set an initial size of the array and a maximum size. Maybe I'll set the initial size to 5. And here, I, I just, for various ends, I make a vector of random numbers. And then I run a sorting algorithm, and I time how long it takes. And then I print how long it took. So if I call, I have, I have functions down below called like BOGO sort, and I have selection. I have these different sorts that I'm going to teach you about today. So uh, if you run this for BOGO sort, then <laughs> it, it, it takes half a second for it to even sort uh, 10 elements. Wait, let me do something here. Instead of n times 2, let me do n plus plus. I think it's really funny to see the runtime grow for this. So it's, it's a little bit nonlinear. But what I love about it is like, if you just add one more <laughs> element, it takes it like 10 times as long as the previous number of elements, because it's like factorial, you know? So an 11th element takes 11 times as long. A 12th element takes 12 times as long as that. So this would probably take like four or five seconds, I would guess, for, uh, for 11 elements. Although <laughs> that's an average case. It might, might be stuck. I don't know. We'll come back. I'll leave it running while we can. I don't want the lecture to get blocked by big O of n factorial code here. Um, but anyway, this algorithm is kind of stupid. So let's move on to a real sorting algorithm. I think this is just funny to talk about. Um, selection sort is our first like actual legit real sorting algorithm that I want to talk to you about. Selection sort is the following. You, you, you sweep across the array or vector, 
and you find the smallest element and you move it, you swap it to the front. So like in this data right here, uh, I think the smallest value is negative four, I think. So I sweep across, I find it, aha, uh -huh, and I swap that to the front of the array, okay? Now it's very important, I wanna make sure you understand, this is not like vector where you say remove and everybody shifts over and stuff. This is like I swap. I swap the values of two elements. And that's really important that I do it that way because if I remove and add, everybody's gonna be shifting, shifting, shifting. That's gonna be really slow. I don't wanna be doing that, okay? So I swap basically the front index with the smallest one. So now after that first sweep, the first index stores the right first value in it, right? Now you do another sweep, but you start from the second index, index one. You sweep across, looking for the smallest remaining element, and you move that to index one. So now, boom, in the number uh, two, which was down there, gets uh, swapped to the second index. Now you sweep again, starting from index number two, the third index, and you find the remaining uh, smallest element, which I think is seven, and that swaps to index three, right? How many of these sweeps do you need to make? O of n? So I mean, I don't mean a big O of the whole algorithm. I just mean like how many times, so do you understand like to figure out who to move to the front, I have to like walk across the array and look at all the values and see and find which one is the smallest one, right? So how many of those sweeps do I have to do? I have to do n minus one of them? Yeah, that's probably right because the very, very last one, there's nobody after them to to swap with so we just don't do it. Yeah, so basically n, right? n minus one sweeps. How long does a sweep take to run? A single sweep? n, it kind of depends, right? The first sweep takes n, and then the next sweep takes n minus one. I mean, the overall runtime of this algorithm is something like, uh, you know, n plus n minus one plus n minus two plus, right? It, it's something like that, all the way down to three plus two plus one. It's something, something in that nature, yeah? So if you know some of your uh, math uh, identities, you know that there's a, a, a simplification of this summation. Uh, that series there equals n times n plus one over two. Um, it's basically about half n squared. If you don't have a good instinct for why that is, I, I, I've heard a, a nice uh, description is that if you, if you take this n here and you sort of pair it up with this one, that makes n plus one, right? Then if you take this n plus one, or n minus one, excuse me, and you pair that up with this two, that makes n plus one also, right? If you add them together. How many of those pairs do you have? You have one half n of those pairs, right? you have n over two times n plus one, okay? So that equals, uh, you know, n squared roughly, right? It equals n squared over two roughly. n squared plus the half n, something like that. So uh, the big O of selection sort is n squared. That's my point. That's how long this run time is for this algorithm. And look, if you don't believe me and my weird math and stuff, you can just run the code and you can measure it and you can test and see, right? You can empirically verify. Oh, <laughs> look, uh, <laughs> I love this. 11 elements took 45 seconds, 12 elements faster. <laughs> because random, hooray, you know, who knows what'll happen. Uh, okay, I'm gonna stop that program now. Um, let's go back to that same program. I've got selection sort here. Uh, I've got an implementation of it in this file. If I jump down to there, you can actually, I didn't show you the code because I just wanted to talk about it in terms of the concept, but here's what the code would basically look like. Um, you start with index i and you walk across up from i plus one to size looking for if there's anything smaller than i. And if you find something smaller, you swap them. Swap just takes each index and puts the other value into it, okay? So um, <clears throat> if you have, you know, big O instincts, you might say, oh, I've got two for loops, both of which go up to the size of the vector, which is n. So that typically, when you have two nested loops that go up to the size of a collection, that usually means that the loop, the, the code is n squared, big O of n squared, right? So there you go. Now, but just to verify that it is big O of n squared, let's actually run it. And what I want to do here is, uh, I think the best way to illustrate big O is to run with different sizes that are doubles of each other. 
double the size each time. So we'll start at a size of 10 and we'll go up to like 100K or so and see how long the code takes to run. So I think if you ignore the low numbers, the tiny numbers, which are more, uh, which are subject to more fluctuation, you see that um, it roughly quadruples. When you make n twice as big, you have made the runtime four times as big. So the difference of the runtime is the square of the difference of the input size. If I were to triple the n every time, the runtime would go up by nine. If I were to do 10x the input every time, the runtime would go up by 100. So the change of the runtime is the square of the change of the input size. So this is an n squared uh, algorithm, right? Almost exactly times four once you get to the bigger numbers here, okay? That's selection sort. The kind of stuff I might ask you to do on a test would be like, here's an array. If you were running selection sort, show me what the first couple of sweeps of selection sort would do. And you just show me which elements get swapped or something like that. I think you can handle that. Those aren't the hardest questions usually on the test, so you'll probably be okay. You have any question about selection sort or how it works? Yeah? Is there an edge case for if like the number at the index is the lowest number or would it just work? Like swap well, Yeah. Index? What does it do if you're, you're trying to pick who goes in index number four and you walk across and what's already there is already the smallest value? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, um, this code here that uh, we have for selection sort, it says swap. And I think the code for swap says, oh, it doesn't. But I think what you could do, like basically you could just say if i isn't j, then swap the three. That would probably give you a small runtime boost. But all the rest, the big O would still be n squared and stuff like that, right? OK, so um, that's selection sort. Remember how we talk about best case, worst case, average case? We just talked about the big O being n squared. I think we were kind of talking about just in general, the average is usually about n squared. What about best case, worst case? Is there any times that it's going to take less than n squared? Uh, you know, the, the BOGO sort had a best case of n. Remember that? And that was if you feed it a sorted input. If you feed this a sorted input, like you were just asking about, what if some of the values are already in the right sorted indexes, right? If I feed a sorted input to, uh, to selection sort here, is it going to run in faster than n squared time, do you think? Or what do you, you think is going to happen? Yeah? Yeah, it's about the same. It's not really going to be much faster because it still has to sweep across to verify. Like, it doesn't know the array is sorted until it does all those sweeps, basically. I guess you could imagine an optimization where if you sweep across and somehow you're checking if it were sorted as you swept across, you could maybe stop if it were sorted. We don't have that optimization here. So the code as written is O of n squared basically all the time. It doesn't really matter much if the input's already sorted or, or mostly sorted or, or something like that, okay? Just, just letting you know, the average and the worst case and the best case are kind of all the same here. Okay, well, let's look at another one if you don't mind. Um, oh, that's just a runtime graph. We already talked about the runtime. Um, and it's n squared. Let's talk about another one. It's called insertion sort. Insertion sort is, generally speaking, slightly better, slightly faster than selection sort. What insertion sort does is it thinks of the array as having two components, a front part that's sorted already and a later rest of the array that isn't sorted already. In certain sense, selection sort also has that property. Like as your index i is growing, all the elements to the left of that are in the right places. But um, I guess it's slightly different because insertion sort, the part on the left is relatively sorted, but it might not be the very smallest stuff. So here's the idea. What you do is you start growing a sorted region at the left by adding an element to it at a time. And as you add an element to it, you move that element into its proper place in the sorted region. And if you keep doing that as the sorted region grows, eventually when it consumes the whole array, the whole array will be sorted. I like to say insertion sort is the most analogous to what a lot of people do when they sort things. If you're picking up cards of a hand or <laughs> as a teacher, the example I always think of is you got a bunch of tests and you got to sort them by last name, you know. Basically what you do is you got a pile in your hands and you got the unsorted pile on the table. And you pick up a new one and you're like, okay, I got three in my hands. The last names are A and B and Y. And this one is, you know, L. So it goes after the A and the B but before the Y. So you sort of take a new one and put it in a sorted order in your pile. Take a new one. You know what I mean? Like you've got a small pile that's growing that's sorted and you add things to that pile as you go along. Um, this, I'll show you a picture and an example in the code in a second. But the runtime of this is also n squared, big O of n squared. 
So in terms of like what you might call complexity class or, or something, it's not any better than selection sort. But you know, we talk about how those constants don't matter very much in Big O, but this is an n squared that happens to usually have a lower constant than <laughs> selection sort does. So within the class of n squared, you can still have things that are faster than other things, right? So this is considered to be a little better than selection sort. Uh, here's a picture. Uh, so what you do is you, you think of the first index, like 0, as being a one element pile that is sorted by definition, because one element can't be out of order with itself. So now what you do is you look at index uh, uh, number 1, the second element, and you say, OK, that second index is 2. That's out of order of my pile. So I'll swap it so that now I have a sorted pile of size 2. Now you've got 2 and 15 that's sorted. So now you, you look at index, the third index, index 2, and you say, I want to include him in my sorted pile. Well, he's out of order, so I'll swap him back until he's in order. You see? So like a, an example of one that's kind of interesting is maybe this guy right here. If, if all the rest of this is sorted, but then you want to include this guy, then the way you get him into the right place is you swap, 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 swap until he's in the right spot. Um, selection sort kind of looks way ahead and figures out a large swap to do. This algorithm does neighbor swaps to move you back one index at a time until you get to the right place. So one interesting property of this algorithm is that it actually runs faster. Unlike selection sort, it runs faster if there's less swapping to do. When will there be less swapping to do? If it's already sorted, that's true. But also if it's mostly sorted, if it's nearly sorted, if it's not like totally horribly out of order, this algorithm will run faster. So um, if you want to see the code for this, Basically, the algorithm is something like you have a int i that's like your, um, your limit of how big your sorted pile is. And then you have an int j that you're walking back until it gets to 0 or until you're in sorted order. So it looks something like this. You have an int i. This is basically the end point of your sorted pile. And now you, um, <clears throat> you start at j, of, which is i, and you swap back. Int j is the new element. And you swap them back as long as necessary, as long as it's greater than the the element that you're trying to insert. So <clears throat> it's got two loops, a for loop for the growth of the sorted pile, and a while loop to swap back until each new element is in the right place. For loop, while loop, they're both nested. They both seem to have something to do with the size of the array. The outer loop is clearly related to the size of the array. The inner while loop, it's not as clear what the boundaries of the inner while loop are. But I guess the way of thinking of it is it starts at i, which is somehow related to the size and it loops, at worst, all the way back to 1. So it, at worst, it kind of goes all the way back to the start of the array. If you want to see this thing in action, here's insertion sort. Oh, you know what I, I should have done? Um, when you run this, you get output, you know? So, so like here's output from selection sort. So let me just keep some runtime data here. Uh, this is a selection takes about that long. I don't know why I have those line breaks, but whatever. There. Now let's do insertion sort. And uh, I'll just change this here to say insertion sort. Compile and run. And here we go. And so, I mean, it's a little hard to compare because the fonts aren't the same size, I guess, but uh, I think what we see is that um, it's a little bit faster. Sorry that I can't quite line these up perfectly, but you know, if you look at uh, 2560, it takes selection sort 400 milliseconds and it takes insertion sort 280. And uh, you know, size 10 240 takes 4.6 versus 3.6 seconds. So you kind of see it's like a little bit uh, better, a little bit faster, right? For just randomly shuffled up data, but it still has the times four approximately on uh, the runtime, right? When we go from 8 to 36, 36 to 16, it's like roughly times four. And if you were to keep graphing it for larger and larger input data, I think you would see that trend continue. So we're still talking about n squared here, right? Um, the best case I think we mentioned was when it's sorted or mostly sorted. Turns out if it's already completely sorted, the whole uh, function is big O of n, which is really cool. So that's a nice property for insertion sort to have in the best case. If it's in the worst case, 
it's still n squared, but it does quite a lot of swapping. So I, I think in the very worst case, insertion sort is actually a little slower than selection sort because it does so much swapping. Um, but anyway, so there you go. Do you have any questions about insertion sort? I think selection sort is easier to implement correctly. If you had to code it, you know, they gave you a blank canvas, here, code this. But I think insertion sort is more like what humans do when they are actually sorting physical objects, but whatever. Okay, oh, let me, before I forget, I'm gonna copy and paste the runtime of insertion sort so we can compare all these different ones. Okay, there. Okay, now I wanna start teaching you about some kind of cool, fancy sorts. You ready for that? Um, let's talk about merge sort. This may be the last one that I, that I get to today. We'll see. Merge sort is a really interesting algorithm. What you do is, it's called a divide and conquer algorithm. You split the data in half, you sort the two halves, and then you merge the two sorted halves back together into a sorted whole. So there's of course more detail to it than that, but that's the basic idea. Have you, ever sort, have you ever had two piles that were sorted and you had to merge them together into one sorted pile? There's actually a pretty easy algorithm for that. Imagine it's two piles of tests and the tests have a person's name on them. Basically what you do is you look at the two piles and whichever one alphabetically comes first, you grab that one. And then you just repeat. You know, the, the, the second pile, the pile that you grabbed out of, now there's a new paper on top of that because you grabbed from there. So now you compare again, whoever comes first, grab from there, whoever comes first, grab. Grab whichever one comes first repeatedly. If you just keep doing that until both piles are exhausted, you will have now built a one pile that was sorted, you understand? So that's what merge sort does. Divide in half, sort the halves, and then merge them together. This algorithm is usually implemented recursively. We'll talk about why in a minute. Its runtime is big O of n log n. And I want you to remember that when you're comparing big O of n squared to big O of n log n, those might not seem very different. Because like on the sort of sorted scale of big O, they're kind of like right next to each other, you know? But I want you to understand that that's way better. <laughs> n log n is way, way, way better than n squared. And we'll see that in a minute. So, okay, let's try to understand how this algorithm works a little bit more. Here's an array, I want to sort it using the merge sort algorithm. So what do I do? I split it in half, and now I sort the halves. How do you sort the halves? Well, <laughs> you could call insertion sort on them or something, right? But, hmm, if only I had a faster sorting algorithm than that that I could use. What if I merge sorted the halves? What if I recursively called my own function on the halves? Well, that sounds like kind of a crazy idea, but you guys have been doing so much recursion that you probably are comfortable with this crazy idea by now. Um, so if we merge sorted that left half, that would repeat the whole cycle again. We would split that, right? And then we would sort the halves of that. How do we sort those? We would merge sort them again. <laughs> so we split this again into little teeny individual elements. And now, we have, now that we've split those, we have to sort them how do you sort 22? How do you sort 18? There's nothing to do, right, if it's only one element. Hmm. That seems like a very basic case, you might say, of this algorithm. Hmm. Interesting. So maybe we don't need to do anything. So now that you have trivially done nothing and sorted those two one element arrays, we now need to merge them into one. So how do we do that? Think of them as piles, and you just grab the smaller one from each pile until you're done. Well, the 18 smaller, so I'll grab them, and then now the only left is 22, so I'll grab them, so I get that, right? Now I've got to do the same thing over there to that 12 and negative 4, split them, sort them, there's nothing to do, merge them, the negative 4 comes first, so it goes like that. Now after all that's done, I was trying to do that so I could sort that 4 element array up above. So let's take these two files that are now sorted individually and let's merge them. So grab the smallest one, grab the negative four, and then grab the 12, and then grab the 18, and then grab the 22, and you get that. And then all that same magic you do over here on the right side. Split them, split them again, nothing to do. Merge them again. Split these two, nothing to do. Merge them. Now merge these two piles, grab the seven, grab the 31, grab the 42, grab the 58. 
sorted pile. Now we got two, four element sorted piles, so grab, grab, grab until you put those back together. And after all this mumbo jumbo, you've sorted the array. Now, if you're skeptical, I hear you. You might be saying, what? There's no way that's faster than just like looping around and swapping people and stuff, right? Because that just seems like a lot of work, doesn't it? But you just got to trust me. I mean, big O is all about large values of n. And I'll, I'll just have to convince you that this will be faster if we implement it properly. So um, let's again talk about, I think the hardest part of this algorithm is the merging part, where you have the two sub piles that are sorted individually, and you need to put them together into a single sorted pile. So how do you do that? Well, here's a picture. Imagine that you have these two piles of size four, and you need to merge them. I think the simplest way to implement this is to have, think of them as two little vectors, I guess. And you think of it as like you have indexes that point to where you're at in each pile. So like int i1 is going to look at where I'm at in the first pile. And int i2 is kind of where I am at in the second pile. And as you pick from a pile, you plus plus the index to move forward past. So you start out here, you're comparing 14 to 23, 14 smaller. So you take 14 and you plus plus that i1 to be 1. Now you're comparing 32 to 23, 23 is smaller, so you take that and you plus plus that. Do you see kind of how you do this? You just repeat until you've exhausted both piles and then you've built the sorted result. So we all have strong programming muscles in our brains. I bet we could implement this, right? Let's go try. Um, this is the only one I want to try to code with you guys together just because I think it's the only one that's really you know, exciting to, to try to implement as a, pair, as a group here. So um, let's say merge sort here. And I've got a function that says merge sort right here, right? Let's do it. So remember what I said. I said split the, the data in half into two halves. And then I said sort the halves. And then I said merge them, right? OK, I will help you with some of this. Because I know, you know, we have to work together here. So I'm going to do the hard part. The hard part of splitting the data into halves, that sounds messy. There is a nice method in the vector class called sublist, where you pass a starting index and a length, and it'll slice, it's like substring, you know, it'll slice out that many elements and return that as a new vector. So what if I said something like uh, vector of ints left equals v dot sublist? What are the indexes of the first half? Zero to what? Length over two? Yeah, v dot size over two, right? Cool. And then vector of ints right, uh, that equals v dot sublist from v dot size over two to the end. I think if you don't pass a second parameter, it'll just go all the way to the end. So there. <laughs> I did the hard part. Uh, how do I sort these halves? Should I call insertion sort on the left and insertion sort on the right? What should I do? Yes? I should recur, recur, so I should call merge sort. Doesn't it still feel weird to do that? You're like, merge sort doesn't work. I'm writing it, and I have no confidence in it yet. <laughs> but yeah, like once we're done, that's going to be the right thing to say. You're exactly right. Um, now we have to merge them. Before I do that, I will say, when I give these lectures on sorting, the most common mistake I make is the one that I make jokes about, the one that I always ask you about when I ask you questions about recursion. What am I forgetting in this code so far? I love you guys. I taught you something. It stuck. You guys remember about base cases. It makes me happy. Um, yes, we need a base case, right? So you know how base cases work. It's usually like if something, then I don't need to do any recursion, right? The stuff that we're implementing seems like the tricky hard case where we do need to do recursion. When do I not need to do recursion? What is an easy vector to sort? Yeah, if it's only one element or even if it's zero, like basically if v dot size is less than or equal to one, lol, nothing to do, right? I said less than or equal to one because it's, I guess it's possible they could pass in an empty vector. Let's just make sure we handle all cases. Okay, no wait, this doesn't, it doesn't like this. Is this, have I, have I done it wrong in terms of not needing a second parameter? Maybe I do need a second parameter. Okay, so the, the length is going to be, uh, 
uh, v dot size minus left dot size. That's all the remaining elements, whatever. So um, sort the halves, merge the halves. OK, remember what we said about the merging algorithm. We said that you should, I'll put the picture back up on the screen, you should have these indexes that go into the, um, the two vectors, left and right. And remember that we're assuming our code is working, so when we said that we were merge sorting the halves, we were assuming that, uh, that that worked. And now that after that has returned to us, that those halves are now sorted, right? So I guess, I guess what I could do here is I could say, uh, you know, left and right are sorted now. Merge them. So let's follow this picture here. So let's make an i1 and an i2. Int i1 equals 0. And that's the index in the left array. And int i2 equals 0. And that's the index in the right array. Yeah? So now let's just repeatedly pick which one is smaller. I think this is probably going to be uh, a while loop, maybe while i1 is less than left dot size or i2 is less than right dot size. You know, like once, once both of these ints have exceeded the size of their part of the vector, then they're, well, we're done, right? So I think what we need to do is we need to decide should I take from the left or from the right? And I think the code is going to have the following form, like if something take from left, <laughs> else take from right. I mean, that might sound really obvious, but I mean, okay, let's just ignore the if part for a second, but how do you take an element from the left? What does that mean? Where is the element from the left side that I would be taking? Index zero, well, I think in the general case, it's index i1, right? So if I said left bracket, basically what I'm comparing right now is I'm comparing left bracket i1 with right bracket i2, and I want to take the smaller of those two things, right? Where am I taking this from? Where am I putting this? Well, do you remember the goal here is to sort vector v? So right now, I've pulled out the contents of v, I've sorted them, and now I need to put the sorted results back into v. So I think a good way to do this would be to clear out v, or, or I guess what you could do is you could say, um, another way of writing this loop header would be like, I'm trying to set each of the, of the values of v. So I could do something like for int i equals zero i is less than v dot size uh, i plus plus. And so the goal here is I'm either gonna set v i to be left i1, or if I'm taking from the right, I'm going to set vi to be right i2. Do you understand? So like, I'm picking what to put into the sorted version of, of v. Um, right. So if you take something from the left, I think I'm forgetting something. If you look at the picture here, taking that element and putting it over in v, I did do that part. But what else do I need to do? Maybe somebody I haven't called on. Yeah. Yeah, I have to add one to the index. Like, if I take from i1, I have to move i1 ahead by one. So I'm looking at the number 32, like in my top picture there, right? Yeah, so as you say, let's do i1 plus plus. And if you take from the right, let's do i2 plus plus. Yeah? So now I skip that if statement. It's probably bothering you. If, you, if you're like me, you just hate that underline. Ah, fix it. Ah, Marty, ah, fix it. Right? You can't stand watching that, that unwritten uh, piece of code there. So what is the test? I mean, I think basically if the left one is smaller, you take the left one, right? So I think the initial attempt to write this would be like if left i1 is smaller than right i2, then I'll take from the left side, right? That is mostly correct. There's one problem with it, though. Do you know what that is? Yeah? Yeah, this code wouldn't do the right thing if we've already fallen off the edge of one or the other of the arrays. If you've already consumed all the elements of the left, then you can't go access bracket i1 because it'll be out of bounds. And if you've already consumed all the elements of the right, you can't go access element and index i2. That'll go out of bounds. So I think basically I want to patch this if test to be 
if there's nothing left on the right side or the one on the left side is smaller than the one on the right side. Those are the two times that I want to take something from the left. So uh, something like the following. I think, I think it's a little tricky to get this Boolean test exactly right on the first try. But I think you want something like if I2 has gone past the right size or the, uh, what is it, the I1 hasn't gone past the left size and the left one is smaller. Something like that, right? Like if we're in bounds and it's smaller, then take from the left. Um, so that's the basic idea for merging. I think the merging is the hardest part of the code. The splitting and sorting is sort of the magic easy part where we just call functions and do recursion and stuff. But that's the merging step. I hope it works. Now, if you don't have a lot of confidence that we solved this properly, I will say that up in the main function here, if I call merge sort, it will crash if I did not actually sort the vector. <laughs> so like if it doesn't work, if we're not going to, you know, what if I have this really fast runtime, but I've cheated because it doesn't even sort anything. I, you know what I mean? Like I'm not going to let myself get away with that. Okay, let's try it and let's see how fast it is. You ready? This is supposed to be the big, <laughs> the big moment. Let's watch these runtime numbers together. Uh, here we go. It's done. <laughs> Remember how the other one, uh, maybe, maybe you already forgot what the other one did. Let's, let's go look. Um, here, <coughs> merge sort, there. Um, insertion sort to do 40,000 elements, it took about a minute. Merge sort to do more than that many elements took half a second, less than half of a second. I don't know if you can see that, it's kind of hidden behind my podium here, but uh, that's a lot faster, right? 58 seconds versus, uh, 300 milliseconds, it's like way faster, right? It's way faster. But if you think about it, that makes sense. Remember how I said n squared and n log n are a lot different? It's basically a number where you took out a multiple of n and you added in a multiple of log n. So you took out a multiple of 40,000 and you added a multiple of like 14 or something. It's a lot different, right? That's why the numbers are so different in these runtimes here. Okay, but let's talk about big O, because big O is about growth. Actually, I think these numbers are small enough that it's kind of hard to see a pattern. Let's get bigger numbers. Let's go uh, take it up a notch, and let's go to, instead of going up to 100,000, let's go 10 million dollars and see what happens. So now we're getting a little bit bigger numbers that we can look at here. And I already spoiled the, the ending. You know, I basically told you uh, which, which lady that Ari picked on The Bachelor the other night or whatever the big reveal is supposed to be. Um, I, I told you what was going to happen, that, uh, that it was big O of n log n. But I don't know. Would you know that if you just looked at these numbers? How would you know? I mean, I think if you don't know much about big O and you look at that, you might be tempted to say it was big O of n. Because doesn't it look like it kind of doubles? Like if you double the n, the runtime kind of looks like it's about twice, right? But if you're really being more precise, it's maybe more like 2.4 or 2 point something, you know? And that's kind of what log n looks like, just a little more than linear, a little more than equal the big O, or excuse me, the, the runtime change will be a little more than equal to the input size change that you feed it, okay? So yeah, like, I guess now that we are, this is what I really like to compare, is I can do how many elements, let me go show you that, how many elements. In the time that it takes to sort 20,000 elements with insertion sort, I, I can do, you know, over a million elements in, uh, in merge sort. So I mean, I hope that I've convinced you that merge sort is faster and it, it works, it did sort the data because the program would have crashed if it didn't sort the data, okay? So that's a pretty neat example of, uh, you know, recursive sorting. Um, one other thing that's really cool about merge sort that I'm probably not going to be able to talk about in detail today is that unlike some of these other sorting algorithms, it can be parallelized. Now, you guys probably have heard that, uh, you know, everything's up in these clouds and, you know, there's these big farms full of servers that are working together to crunch giant numbers and problems and stuff like that, right? And of course, what that comes from is the fact that we have basically run out of clever ways to make individual computers a lot faster anymore. It used to be that every couple of years, the speed of one individual computer would, would double. 
you know, it's Moore's law that would say that computers will get faster and faster and faster, but we're kind of running out of space. We're starting to be limited by things like the speed of light, you know, <laughs> the size of atoms and molecules are starting to be a problem for us. You know, so it's like we're kind of running out of space to make those same speed ups. So the only way we can make things faster is to have lots of computers to throw at the problem, right? Well, so we haven't talked really at all in this class about parallel algorithms, like taking one algorithm and having two workers, two computers work on it, or more than two. And it's kind of out of the scope of this class. Maybe someday we'll, we'll teach about it. Frankly, part of the reason we don't teach you about it is because C++ doesn't have very good support for that kind of stuff. Because C++ was made uh, around the same time that I was. <laughs> uh, so whatever. But what I will say is merge sort is very conducive to being split up and parallelized by multiple computers. And I hope you can see why. I mean, you're literally splitting up the work, right? So it's only one step removed to sort of send half the data to some other computer and say, here, you sort this part, I'll sort my part, and once we're done, we'll merge them all back together. And so that is a very powerful thing. Now, hey, I said that they go with n log n, and we basically, basically verified that by looking at it. But I don't know if you would have confidence in that by looking at this code. If you go right here to this code, I mean, first of all, we have not talked very much about big O when it comes to recursion. Frankly, because it's harder to talk about. You take some of our theoretical courses, I think it's 109, 161, you'll learn about something called recurrence relations. Or is that in 103? I always forget where, which course has what content. But you will learn about ways to reason about recursive algorithms when it comes to runtime. But I look at this, it's not entirely clear to me that this is big O of whatever. So how do you have an intuition about such a thing? Well, here's my attempt to give you an intuition. This loop right here, how long does this loop take once, to run this loop once? What's the big O of that entire loop to finish? Well, how many repetitions does it do? It does n repetitions, right? How much work is each repetition doing? looking at a couple indexes and plus plusing and gaining. Doesn't that seem like a constant amount of work? Okay, so that work is n. How many times do I have to do that? Here's a picture. If you split up, split up, split up, split up, and then each of those split ups has to walk across n to finish its work, it sort of, you can sort of think of the work to be done as a two-dimensional space, you might say. Amount of work done by each call, and then vertically is kind of the number of calls or the totality of all the calls we need to make. So it really comes down to like how tall does this stack of calls get? And if you're dividing by two, dividing by two, dividing by two, what you're really asking is how many times do I have to divide n by two until I get down to a stop of one element? The number of times you have to divide n by two to get to one is the log base two of n. So it's kind of like n times the log of n is sort of the work that needs to happen here. That's kind of a rough intuition of why this thing takes about big O of n log n to, to run. Yes? Um, it's still a lot faster how many times I divide each second. So if I were divided by five. What if you split it into fifths or sixths or twelfths or something? Yeah, I mean, you start getting into like log base five or log base whatever, but what you find is that any log can be converted to any other log. So it's kind of just a constant times log. But what does happen is if you have these multiple workers, multiple processors, then you start thinking like, well, wait, what if this part's done by computer one and this part's done by computer two, and they're actually all happening at the same time? That makes the big O calculation really interesting to talk about. It makes it harder to talk about, but it makes it faster and more interesting. Well, I'm out of time, so I have to stop there. But uh, that's sorting, and uh, I'll see you guys again on Friday, and we'll talk about inheritance. Thanks a lot.